Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with John Demko of Demko Knives. John and his brother Andrew have created a family business on some of the most innovative, hard-use folding knives in the business, which to me sounds a bit like the American dream. But running a small business is rarely a dream with its challenges and tribulations. Just ask John, who took on much of the business brunt of things back when customs were all Demco knives produced. Well, recently Demco Knives took the knife world by storm with the release of its first full production folder, the AD20.5. Wish this one were mine, it's going to my brother. Which, in classic Demco fashion, is built around an innovative and nearly bulletproof lock. I look forward to talking with John about taking the production plunge, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell. And while you're there, check out my knife close-up videos like the one I just did on the AD 20.5. Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and other interviews with great makers and personalities that make the knife world happen. Now, if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying exclusive opportunities and content, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever strop a knife again? Even though it gets no real use, face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. John, welcome to the show. How's it going? Good, good. How you doing? I'm doing great. Good to have you here. Well, I had the pleasure of meeting you a little, well, at this point, over a month ago yeah. at Blade Show. And uh, you guys, you and your brother, and you had several other people work in your booth, were just beset with people the entire time. So congratulations on the on your popularity. You. Uh, Blade Show was crazy. It was, it was great. Yeah. It was, uh, that was my first time there. I had a lot okay. of fun. Yeah. yeah. So John, um, as I mentioned up front, you guys have just taken the plunge into production knives. Uh, before we get to that, cause I really want to talk about the AD 20.5. I keep opening it up and showing <laughs> it off. I love it so much. This, uh, unfortunately I bought for my brother and I, uh, it's going to go in August, so I'm just taking advantage of it while <laughs> I have it. But um, before we get to that, you worked a little bit uh, during your brother's tenure at Cold Steel. Isn't that right? Uh, with him at Cold Steel, or are you talking about in Demco Knives? No, no. Uh, you worked for Cold Steel for a while. Yeah. So he, um, he went to Blade Show and met Lynn. Uh, I want to say I was still in high school. Would have been I, 2006, maybe when he got going with Cold Steel. So that that summer between 11th grade and 12th grade for me, I um, I started working with Andrew in the knife shop, and it was just to help him out with things. And then I I worked the whole way through my senior year uh, in the summertime and into college and stuff. And I did my first two years of college at a community college locally. So I worked full time with Cold Steel that whole time. Um, and then I went to Penn State. When I was at Penn State, I'd come home on the weekends and vacations and stuff and help him with all the prototypes and all that kind of fun stuff. Worked on a lot of the, the triad locks, all those tests and all that, all that fun stuff. So did you have a hands-on sort of um, role in uh, helping, helping sort of prototype these things? Yeah. Um, Andrew would come up with the design and I would kind of help him out with it. Not not really taking credit for the design, but you know, he'd be between a couple of things and I'd be like, Oh, I like that one better. And we'd test two of them out. And then um, at the time we would uh, cut stuff out of a steel pattern and then we'd use that steel pattern to make more handle shapes and stuff. So we would make one for us. We'd make one to go to California for, you know, Lynn to test out and he would change something Then we'd change it all, do it again. When it came down to it, we would, we'd have to make like six, some for us to keep in house, some for Lynn to keep and some to go to the factories overseas. So basically everything that went in production, we'd have to make a bunch of handmade samples, basically just the same as a custom knife, maybe not quite the same attention to finishing, like with the nice satin finishes and stuff, but basically making custom knives. All right. All right. So uh, the triad lock, of course, that was my, uh, my uh, introduction to Demco knives and uh, everything 
everything that has grown out of there. I'm a big Cold Steel fan. I, I probably have more Demco designs in my collection than anything else. The Triad Lock, is that old and cold for you guys now? Are you still allowed to make that? Uh, how does that work? No. Um, Andrew sold the Triad Lock to Cold Steel. Uh -huh. So they, they completely owned that. And he was when he was working for Cold Steel, his agreement was he was still allowed to make him at the same time. Um, he's not no longer employed with Cold Steel because of the switch of ownership and all that. Uh, but honestly, and me, maybe even more than Andrew, I do not care at all. I hate making triad locks. <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, they're just, they're very complicated. There's a lot of uh, intricacies in them. It's, it's like one little thing's not working right. It's just, you got to start over, you got to go back. And what a lot of people don't realize is the the scorpion lock it was an improvement because it was better easier to make it it took out some of the finicky things in the triad lock and it made them easier to manufacture because essentially the scorpion lock and the triad lock work the same except the pin moves and the scorpion lock and the triad lock that lock bar tang area moves mm. um and it's just it's more free floating with the way the pin goes in on the scorpion lock and and then even past that going into the shark lock that's even an easier way to manufacture that same type of lockup so those are all like a, a logical progression from each other not just in performance but in manufacturability okay so you talk about um you talk about the triad lock the scorpion lock and the shark lock all kind of in the same breath and uh for a neophyte you look at them they look very very different but you say they're kind of all progressions of the same concept what would you yeah, say absolutely. that concept what is that concept the the stop pin and them they all the pressure from the lock and the blade go into that stop pin so i can i don't actually have a triad lock from everything i grabbed no i don't wait Odd, I, oddly, I, do. I don't have one around me either I, I, you know what i have a cold steel one in this drawer right here i didn't mean to break it so the triad lock has that stop pin uh -huh. so would um the lock force is goes into that pin and the, any force up and down on the blade is driven into that pin. And there's a lot more to it, but that's uh, that's what really makes it strong and durable because with the force of the all that stuff going into that pin, this can self-adjust to that. It's explained a lot better in the cold steel catalog. When you look at the scorpion lock, that pin here moves in that area behind it and the tang would be with the lock bar is here so it's just it's the same same sort of lock up but different parts move right i never thought of it like that of course i'm thinking of what you can see and how you fidget with it i'll be totally honest well, well and yeah that's exactly that's what no, no one at all thinks about this because they're not making it. Right. And then like it looks so much different and you manipulate it so much different, but they are evolutions of each other. So you're holding in your hand uh, a custom, uh, presumably a custom 8015 there. This is an MG. I don't oh, have right. actually any customs. Okay. So MG stands for machine ground and that refers only to the bevel on the blade. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. So are you guys still producing the AD 15? We're not right now, but that doesn't mean we're done with it. It's just, we're a small shop. We can only really run one project at a time and the twenties, you know, crazy right now. So. Right. Right. Okay. I want to come back to this. I love this knife. I, there will be more. Yeah. I love it. I have the cold steel version of it, but at some point I want to get the, uh, out of your hands, out of, out of the shop's hands, uh, version like I have, of the beautiful AD20. Now, I was looking for this knife. This is an MG, as you can mm -hmm. probably tell from the blade. Uh, but I was looking for this knife for a while. And then I sort of gave up. You know, I was like, I, I, you know, I'm kind of like a dog with squirrels. I see another one. I'm off after that. And then uh, a, a great buddy of the show um, texted me one day while I'm at work, minding my own business. And uh, his local knife shop had received six of these. And he sent me a photograph. I'll buy one for you right now, Bob. I know you want one. Just pay me back. And so I, I looked at them all. And I'm like, oh, gosh, do I want the hole in the blade or not? To what color G10 do I want? And I settled on this beautiful uh, sort, nice. of, sort of wine red 
You remember this? Yeah. One? <laughs> <laughs> um, that red, it, it's been really popular. We did a poll on our Facebook page, and that was the color that most the most people picked. Really? I was surprised, yeah. Not that we have made as many as other things, but it seems like a lot of people like that color. Yeah, I, uh, I've i been into, you know, sort of burgundy, maroon uh, handles. And this to me, um, and, and I am not crazy about straight up red G10, I got to say, but this to me veered more towards that wine color. And yeah. I saw it and I was just like, oh my God, send that to me. Take my money. Uh, <laughs> But so so this is this is your most current uh, knife. This and the eighty twenty point five, the production Correct. version of it. Tell us about a little bit about the Shark Lock and why you think it is so very popular. Um, I I think we got lucky with a lot of things about it being popular. One was we were able to do this at a good price point, and that goes back to the manufacturability of it. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking about. You know, the, the strength is pretty much on all, all between the Triad Lock, Scorpion, and Shark is going to be based on the materials they're built with because they're all so very similar. You have, you know, bigger tang areas on one. It's going to be a stronger knife, you know, just depending on that. So, but when you look at, let me grab, I'll even, I'm going to grab the, the Grivery 8020. So you have on this, you have the blade. You have the shark lock, you have the handle material, you have these oh, got tape on there. Um, <laughs> it's my user. Yeah. Um, and uh, you got this, the inserts here that, you know, reinforce the pins yeah. on the scorpion lock. You have titanium here. You have a titanium backspacer. You have these pins that have to hand fit. You have titanium liners. So, that's where all the cost is the the machine time on that and the material cost so with this knife this is actually 350 the g10 one is 425 this the original regular price was retailing at 675 mm. that's not as accessible as 425 or you know depending on the variations there so for one coming in at that price point made it appealing to a lot of people and uh, another thing that we weren't even expecting, like, because it's not something we really pay attention to, it's how fidgety it is. Everyone loves that. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's like, and for, for me, it's like, it's awesome, but I never was like, oh, that's, that's going to sell nice for us. But then people get a hold of them, they do all kinds of stuff, and you don't have the slot in yours, but people love that middle finger flick. Oh, you can still do it with the with the. Uh, you can still do it with the. With yeah. The film stud. That's funny. You guys, uh, you and your brother both. Uh, you know, I've spoken to your brother a bit, and uh, I, like I said at Blade Show, I hung out with you for a little while. You both seem to be very practical kind of engineer types. If if I can pigeonhole you like that, and and it's not surprising to me that the fidget part didn't really work into your engineering ideas because it's kind of um, a pastime for people who have extra knives, you know, <laughs> that that's something that you worry about or think about, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's practical application to being the knife being easy to open, which is important to me. You know, so many times you're holding something down with one hand and you want to be able to close it with one hand, you're still holding something down, you, you know, open and close it with one hand. Right. So there is a practical application to that. Like, a knife is more useful if you can open it and close it easier. It is fidgeting, you know, that's it's awesome, but it's it's not like I said, it's not a selling point. For us, uh, like performance first is always kind of our, our driving force in the designs. And that goes with you know the knife being able to cut, the knife being strong, having a strong lock, and ease of manipulation is in there with that. So when you're thinking about knives, uh, when you, meaning Demco Knives, is thinking about knives and approaching a design, what what are you thinking about? What are the things, I know you just said accessibility uh, of, of manipulation and toughness and that kind of thing, but what purpose do you see them? like Hard use. Like, it, the tactical stuff is, is cool, but that's not, we don't, we're not really trying to brand a tactical knife, although... Okay. A good tactical knife should basically be the same thing as a good utility knife. I mean, your people aren't really fighting with knives, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you should be able to, you know, to cut through what you need to without worrying about it breaking. To do, like, you know, go camping with it, and you know, it'd yeah. be useful. You'd be able to, to shave a stick and that kind of stuff. All the bushcraft stuff. Um, 
I mean, I open boxes all day long, every day. I open open all kind of stuff. The knife should, you know, we, we have a thicker grind on these, but if there's a good edge on it, it can cut through all your everyday stuff. I don't, I don't want the knife to be so big and overbuilt. You can't use it for that, that kind of thing. It should be useful in anything that's reasonable. Yeah. I, so um, I recently went uh, away with my family and there was a hiking aspect to the trip. Um, just one long hike. But uh, of course, you know, when I travel, I, I bring a whole bunch of knives. I'm a total <laughs> nerd. And, you know, I, I think of all the possible eventualities. And of course, the the 8020 came with me. And this actually came on the hike with me. And this is, uh, this was the folder that came on the hike with me. But this is a very you know, it made me feel immediately confident. Like this is an outdoor knife that if I were a big camper, I would use as a camp knife because it really is sturdy and stout and does all that. Um, and it's, some people might find it heavy, but for me, it wasn't too heavy to have in shorts, you know, kind of light hiking shorts. Yeah. And uh, it was the perfect kind of companion for that kind of outdoor, you know, day long well, that's adventure. That's what I love to hear. Cause that's, that's what I see the knives doing. So it's, it's awesome to hear that. And, you know, I think weight's kind of preference for people. Some people don't like a heavy knife and that's fine. There's other knives that are great that aren't heavy. We, we like this weight. It, it allows us to have this build, to have that thick blade, to have that all reinforced in there. So at Blade Show this year, uh, a huge uh, draw, before we get to the AD20, I'm still pushing that off. The huge, a huge draw was all of the um, custom hand ground AD20s that uh, you posted some videos of um, as a tease on Instagram leading up to the show. And man, alive, were they beautiful. Just like all different variations. Like I didn't know that you made a smaller version of this and just uh, different blade shapes. I even, didn't I see, maybe I saw a Tanto in there. I don't remember, but I just remember being overwhelmed by the variety. And when they opened the doors both days, people literally sprinted yeah, to get to was, your booth, which is towards the back. It was crazy. Their, yeah, to get I, their hands on these customs. I was like a deer in the headlights. I wasn't even ready for it. And I saw people <laughs> running and I'm like, I was like kind of slow on my setup too. And I, I, it was it was crazy. I, I'm gonna be better prepared for it next year. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> uh, you know, the 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 800 pound gorilla in the room is the fact that you guys went uh, and and got, you know, started making having these production knives made. But before we get to that, you had all these custom knives. And so tell me a little bit about how your small shop prepares that many custom knives and what you do uh, in that process. Well, oh, that's a that's a heavy question there. <laughs> <laughs> um so let's let's talk about first you saw you mentioned that smaller one yeah that's um that's we were calling that the compact and when we decided we wanted to produce a knife in taiwan we both me and andrew both agreed that we want to do a smaller knife and so what that was is it was the the 80 20 and he shortened the blade and he shortened the handle it used all the same hardware and stuff and it was cool, like that was like our first prototype of the, the 8020.5, but it was a little bit ridiculous. It was really thick. It was, you know, it was just a shortened down version of a bigger knife, not the downsized version that the 8020.5 became, but we liked it. We thought it was cool. We just didn't think it fit for the production for the Taiwan knife. So, but as we were prototyping for that 20.5, we're like, hey, let's get some parts made for this. So we got, um, well, we water or we wire cut the like 20 blades of that compact and we got the titanium made for those handles. And those parts have been sitting around for like a year, like, and just, just sitting there. And Andrew needs to hand grind those because he does the customs. He's better at that than me. I, 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 I can't hand, hand grind a knife and then us put the price tag we do on those because oh, yeah. he, he's a master at that, I'm not. And um, so we have, we've had this part sitting around and then the only time I can get him excited to do stuff and hand grind these knives is like going to blade show. Cause he wants to go into blade show and, and, and have this awesome presentation. And that's how those ended up at blade show, even though we made the parts for them like over a year beforehand. And the same thing with all those customs, a lot of the, 
the blades that became the custom knives at Blade Show, those blanks have been sitting around for since we first made the 8020s. We, we, we prototyped a whole bunch of blades, and the we, we decided on this clip point, and then that's the one that we, we cut a bunch of those for the 20.5, but we had all these blanks sitting around. And, you know, the, the hand ground this is a process. they got to get rough ground. They go to a separate heat treat than our, our MGs do. And they come back, and then they sit around for a long time. And they've been sitting there. I'm like, hey, we should make these. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Then he goes and prototypes a new new design. I'm like, hey, we need to make customs. And he he's like, hey, let's check out this new design. And all the stuff that's it's awesome for the business in the long run, but as I'm trying to do like the day to day sales and, and the production, it's like we we need to sell these customs. He's like, yeah, nah. But coming up the blade show, he was all about it. He came out. He he did a lot of hand grinding, and that's how we ended up with like those like thirty ish customs we took to blade show. Man, they they were beautiful. I got a chance to check out. Uh... Well, a, a couple of them and uh, from people who had already bought them. I, I, okay. mean, I, I was very late to the show by the time I, I mean, very late to your table, you know, yeah. meaning, you know, I got there maybe 10 minutes after they opened the door. <laughs> yeah. And, and some of the, good. some of the blades on there were, were newer blades we were prototyping too. So we maybe cut 10 out uh, or blades that you're going to see coming out in the MG line with within like the next year. Yeah. Talk about those. What, what were those? I know you have the shark's foot, which is your version of yeah. the shark's foot blade. That's very popular. Yeah. So that, that's the one that's actually on the 20.5. Yeah. That's so, cool. so we're, we're doing this in the regular 8020 and there's going to actually be a lot of variation on that. The, the MG 8020 line. We have that. Some of these are going to be run as dealer exclusives, uh, but we have some S 45 VN, some L max, uh, coming out with those uh, in, in the MG8020. And we also soon, real soon coming out, is going to be a D2 line we're doing. Oh, so we're nice. doing, yeah, so we're going to, it's gonna, in the grivery handle, the retail price is going to be 275 Ooh. Yeah, with that, it's going to be a thinner stock. It's going to be D2. And there's, there's a little less um, internal milling and stuff on it because of the thinner blades. So the bearings are a little smaller, so we don't have to pocket those out in the machine. Which helps us reduce the cost again. So we're we're going to be doing this in-house made knife. We sub out the bevel grind. That's the MG, mm-hmm. but this two seventy five price point, and we're we're probably going to have those on the market within a couple months. Nice. Uh, while I was um, kind of lurking around your booth, um, I saw you talking with Laren Thomas oh, yeah. uh, about Magna Cut. Is there uh, any plans? And the, are there any plans in the work for a Magna Cut AD twenty? Absolutely. So we did a few customs. My brother was on the list to um, test out the Magna Cut. And then as soon as he got a hold of that, we uh, we put an order in and we got some sheets of that in. So I, it, we haven't exactly decided what we're doing. Uh, if we're going to do a standard MG run of them or we're going to switch up the, the blade blade style on them. But there are several sheets in the shop and they, they will do something really cool. Okay, you keep holding up the uh, grivery or grivery, however you pronounce it. I you know, never... I've I've said grivery forever, but I don't even know if I'm right. That, that's what I heard. <laughs> well, that's what I heard if, Lynn Thompson say. So, all right. Well, if if you and Lynn Thompson say it, I'm going to say grivery. <laughs> it also just kind of rolls off the tongue better. You've been holding up that uh, yellow grivery one, and I actually checked out that very knife um, while we were there. What is what is the deal with those? Are, are they a regular production? And and yes. Okay. So we, our first run of MGs, uh, the 8020 MG, we did just the G10 and the titanium. And this run that we're running right now, we uh, we got the river made. So let me get the G10 here. So the G10, um, that's OD Green. These are my, my two 8020s that I personally carry. Nice. Um, 425, 350 on the grivery. Okay. Because... I I get this G10, it's cut out into the shape, and then I do three operations on the milling machine with it. I put it in, the mill comes down, it puts the holes in. We flip it over, and it cuts the pocket for that steel insert. And then we put in another fixture, and it perimeters it, puts a nice corner round on it, and does the texture. So all those operations, you know, take time, and right. they, t- they, they take tools in the machine. The grivery we have made because, you know, we don't injection mold in the house. So it's it's basically way 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 cheaper. So you're getting seventy five dollar 
savings on the on the same blade, the same awesome function. I think the Grivery came out awesome, and you know, three fifty price point, and that's what I carry. I, this is the knife I carry more than any other knife. It's three V MG eighty twenty. Is it lighter? Is the Grivery lighter? I don't know. Okay, all right. It, it's uh, about the same. Okay, because, well, one thing I really like about your Grivery knives is when I think Grivery, I usually think black, you know, and black is fine. I like black blades or uh, black uh, handled knives and such, but um, it's nice to to have something that's a little more, well, it's nice to have a variety in any case. Yeah. And uh, so I, I really like that your your Grivery handles are nice and bright and, and you have a variety of them and, um, and like that. So you're talking about using the mill and, and how you cut out the handles and such and all the different operations. Uh, but you also indicated a kind of a difference in approach between you and your brother. Break that down a little bit. What is, what is the, uh, what is the brother partnership? This is one of my favorite aspects of talking to people who work with family in making knives. Um, so first of all, I've learned everything about knife making from Andrew. He's 15 years older than me mm -hmm. and like, when I was a little kid and he would be making knives in the basement, I would go down and like pick up drill bits and think they were the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so like that's, he's always, and he's always taught me like everything. Um, and then at cold steel, when he brought me on to work with, you know, cold steel with him, I, you know, I did everything he wanted me to do. Like he would say, Hey, do this. And a lot of the way he taught me is he would just hand me material and be like, cut this out. And like the first time I ever used a bandsaw, and I just ruined stuff. And he's like, all right, yeah, okay, now do it like this. So like a lot of the stuff, he just kind of just like threw me into the wild and, you know, it was a learning experience, which is great. When I look back on it, like I have that understanding. Um, so, and then I moved out to California for a year to do some projects with Lynn. And that, that was a temporary thing. And that's when Andrew was getting the patent all figured out on the Scorpion lock. So when I was moving back, it's when this was ready to go. So he's full-time, completely busy with cold steel. He can't really do much with Demco knives. Uh, we made the decision that I was going to go on full-time with Demco knives to launch the Scorpion lock. And we were just doing customs at the time in preparation to launch our MG line. And the, the MG line was like when I could actually start making a living making knives. Custom knives are great and awesome, but... I, I can make knives full time because of the MG line. And that's, that's because we can buy the materials like in bulk. We can make a whole bunch of the handles at the same time. We're not spending hours hand grinding stuff. And we can sell things at a more approachable price point so we can reach more customers. And like our custom knives are super popular now, but you know, when, it wasn't always that way. Like the, we were, the 8010 was always pretty popular, but there was still a time you know, a couple of years ago where 8010 would be on the market for, you know, a couple of weeks, which is oh. crazy now. It's, yeah. it's just, to even think about that, it's crazy. But so anyway, so I'm in this full time running the MG line and Andrew, and he's set pretty good from all the stuff, all the money he's made from Gold Steel with his royalties. And I mean, I'd like it, hundreds of designs of Gold Steel with the trial lock and all that stuff. And he, he loves knife making and he just wants to make cool knives but he wants to make them like 90% and then move on to the next thing where like I pick it up at that point and then try to make a whole production line of it and, you know, keep it going and keep these. I mean, I talk to the dealer, all the dealers I work with every day and, you know, customer service and all that. So like, I'm always on that, the other end of the business and he only just wants to prototype stuff. And I'm like, I tell a dealer, I'm going to get them these, you know, 50 knives next week. And he's like, Hey, just, can you do this for me? Can you cut these handles out for this prototype knife? I'm like, oh, you know, it's <laughs> everyone is like breathing down my neck to get the production done. And now you want to switch gears and, you know, do this prototype. And, you know, he did that to me with the, the 8020.5 prototype. And, you know, at the time it was like, I'm trying to make these 8020s, but you can see how it paid off because the 8020.5 eventually made it from that prototype into the production. So it's, I don't want to say I want to do the things that pay off sooner, but that's kind of like where I'm at with, with like the more immediate things. Like I, I'm looking at what's happening within the next year of the business. He's looking at what happens like beyond that. So it's kind of like he's right brain, you're left brain. You both cross over, but you're kind of yeah. a, 
yeah, yin and yang about it. That's pretty cool. That seems to be uh, a recipe for success in a lot of different partnerships, whether it's a marriage or a business partnership or something creative. I mean, your your venture is creative and it's business. Yeah. And uh, okay, let's talk about the 80-20.5. How did that come together. Um, and, and before you, you start talking about this, let me, let me just shower you with compliments. First of all, it, it is a, a really, really, um, it's a great knife on its own. It's a great knife when compared to its, uh, ancestor, the AD 20. Um, it's just an, an outstanding knife and it's small, thin, light, and sturdy as hell. It doesn't feel in any way overdone uh if you know what i mean but it feels like a really hard use knife like i said this isn't mine i haven't been able to horse on it but uh i think i think i think the stars aligned with this thing oh thank you i, I appreciate that all um yeah i mean i i alluded to a couple of the things like we we took our time when we were figuring out what what size to make this knife um like the compact i had talked about was you know it was a little bigger um the, the handle went through a lot of different iterations and that's what I was just talking about where I'm trying to do the production and Andrew was like, Hey, let's try this handle. Let's try this handle. I mean, there were probably hundreds of handle shapes before he just finally decided on this is the one. And I mean, we went through a ton of testing. We, we love the size. Um, for me, it's, it's a little bit smaller than I would want to carry every day, but I was just at a wedding um, last weekend and this fit in my suit pocket and it didn't like look ridiculous. I was like, yeah, right. this is, this is awesome. Um, it, I, I'm impressed with it. When we got the first uh, samples from the factory, I'm like, wow, it's, this is these, this is exactly like what we gave them. It's, and it, it functions as good as we want it to. And I mean, I, I don't want to keep on. <laughs> Well, well so, my own knife compliments, but yeah, we're <laughs> we're very happy with it. So, how did you decide on an OEM? I know they're made in Taiwan. Taiwan seems to make awesome knives. Uh, from from, for instance, the Spiderco knives I have that are made in Taiwan. Those seem to be the best Spidercos. Um, how? What's the process like um, selecting an OEM? That that was all Andrew. He um, he has had a relationship with many different factories overseas from you know, through cold steel mm -hmm. and he um he has been talking with these companies for a lot of a long time and has had great relationships with them so the the company we went with was really a no-brainer just because of the long relationship he had with them so do you have these um do you pr did you initially and in, and in moving into the future uh, presumably you're going to have other production models under the demco knives shingle in the future um do you just make a prototype and send it to them <clears throat> or do you CAD the whole thing out? How does that work? Both. Uh, we're, we're still custom knife makers. So we, we make knives. We're not just like a designer. Right. Uh, sure. That we would draw things and send them. We want to fill them. We, we want them to be able to make their version, hold it next to ours and be like, this is what it's supposed to be because we really care what it's going to end up as. You know, you, you could go that route where you just send them a drawing and, you know, it comes back and you could ride on a brand name and it still sell. Like you don't, you know, you're not really like invested in it in the design the same way, but we are because it's part of our custom knife brand. Sure. I, I, I get that. I guess what I just wasn't sure about is uh, if you guys use CAD at all or if you're all just, you know, about making the thing itself and then having them interpret it. So neither of us are actually engineers. Um, the way we use, the way Andrew draws on the computer and the way that I machine, it's still like, it's like he's almost doing pencil drawings, but on a computer so we can use that language in the machine. And then when I'm, cause I, I completely taught myself how to use the CNC machine we have. And it's not, I'm not trying to like, be like, oh, I'm like some kind of genius. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. The, the conversational program that we use is it's pretty easy, you know, with, with some training, but it's like, I, I didn't go to school for any of that, but I knew how to use manual meals. We use manual meals of cold steel and we kind of just like took the manual milling and automated it. Hmm. And what the drawings Andrew does is he kind of just draws a 2d drawing a lot, like, like he would be pencil drawing it, but then he can send me that 2d drawing and then I can put that in the machine and then 
I can tell the machine how to mach machine that from there. Um, not that not that it's just limited to doing that, but for certain aspects of knife making, that's all you need. Right. Uh, so you talk about working at Cold Steel, and and I know what you mean by that because you and I discussed this. But you at one point had two different shops. You had your own custom shop where you made custom Demco knives, and then you had a totally different shop across town uh, for Cold Steel knives yep. and, and that kind of thing. And I do remember you making, um, you and your brother making testing videos from that shop. And I love those videos. Um, how do you test or do you test your new productions like this knife, for instance, the 8020.5 or the 8020? Tell me about a little bit about the battery of testing and what you're really um, going for. What, what, kind of, um, what kind of hurdles you put in front of yourself? Oh, all the same stuff. This, like anything the triad locks could hold up to. We want to see the same type of weight hangs, uh, spine whacking. It should be able to take pretty hard spine wax and not develop blade play. That's, that's like, we do all that when we're designing the knife and then we repeat those with the production knife. Uh, we eventually will release some weight hang videos of this because it's actually very impressive. Andrew released some numbers, I think, but I don't even know them off the top of my head. Okay. Um, yeah. It was, I, I, I mean, it was, it was holding over 200 pounds, which is crazy for how light this knife is. I mean, that means uh, a lot of us could put two of those in a wall and do pull-ups and, you know, do our tactical wall climb with those. Well, e even more so because that, that weight was all the way back here. So when you're closer up on it, that's multiplied. Right. So do you, um, do you take a hand in designing? Um, I, I have done some designs right now. It's all production for me. I, I, I give some input in what we're doing right now. Like say Andrew comes at me with two blade shapes. I might pick one and that's the one that goes in production. Right. Or I might say, Hey, I think we need to adjust this. And he might tell me to no, he's not going to do that. Or he might, you know, go along with it. So, uh, but that's, I mean, I don't even have time for that with the production. It's there's just, especially with how popular the 8020 is, that's that's all I'm really concerned about right now is making these knives and keeping people from killing me with emails. <laughs> so, I mean, is is that what do you like better, like the customer service and business strategizing part? Because it seems like you've got the the real business strategy part nailed down, or do you like the the um, hands on part? Oh, both of them. I, I love making knives, um, but both of them, you know, just like anything, have their ups and downs. Like dealing with customers can be so rewarding because it just it's it's awesome to see how much people can love something that I make. Yeah. Other times when I answer like the 20th person for the day, why I can't directly sell them Altai 8020, it gets very bogged down. Um, and working with the dealers is awesome. We All the dealers I work with are really cool. They're really great people. But it's business and they want the knives and they want to make money on them. And like, sometimes sure. something happens in the shop. I'm like, I have to tell this dealer, I'm not going to get this order out this week. Mm -hmm. And that's it's stressful. But it, you know, in the end, talking to customers, talking to dealers is very rewarding. And then when it comes to the hands-on stuff in the shop, I, I love assembly knives. I sharpen, do the sharp, the canto on most of the knives. Oh, nice. It's awesome. But like wearing that respirator or wearing headphones and standing there, you know, after you're there for a couple hours, it's like, I don't know if my neck's ever going to recover. <laughs> and so they all, they all have their ups and downs, but I mean, I, all those aspects of the business I love. All right. So let's put it to rest just in case uh, some of those customers are, are watching or listening to this. Why can't you give them full die 80 twenties at their request? Um, cause they're selling so fast. I can't make them fast enough. Um, I made the decision to do, dealer sales because that amount of customer one-on-one -on -one customer service is just too much i, I can't be you know when, when it was especially when this 8020 launched i was the only one in the shop full time mm -hmm. right now andrew's a lot more hands-on because he's not with cold steel we brought in um an, a new employee recently uh, but at the time we launched 8020 i was i was literally doing every single thing to it i was sharpening assembling handling all the orders and all that and it's a lot easier for me to send 50 knives to a dealer and those dealers all have great networks and great marketing and great customer service. And they've really helped push the 8020. It's part of the reasons it became so popular so quick. And um, 
they handle the sales. So I send them an order of you know, 50 knives and order 50 knives, five to 10 are going to be all tied. Those sell out in seconds. And I, I wish I could make them faster. I do. I wish I could give everyone that wants one, one, but I just can't make them fast enough, but I'm trying to make things faster. So is, uh, uh, this is probably an extremely uh, obvious question, but uh, must take longer to mill the, the titanium than it does G10, right? Way longer. And there's longer. more, more, more process to it too. So the, the G10 basically when you, you mill it and you're done milling it, it's ready to assemble the tie. You do the first whole operation. You got to deburr it. So the next operation that sits down flat and then you do that next operation, you got to deburr that, put it in for the third operation. It does that. Then you got to deburr that. And then if it has the texture on it, it then goes into the tumbler to get the stone wash finish. If it's that flat titanium that I don't do a lot of, you got to finish those flats by, you know, on, on a grinder, you got to go through different grits of bell till oh, you get all those geez. lines out. Yeah. yeah. And then if you don't get all those lines out, when you tumble it, they'll, they'll show. So it's, you're talking about the lines from the mill cutting back and forth. The, back no, the, the grinder. Oh, uh, because the grinder. I got you. Because the raw finish on the titanium is ugly. The, right. From the, the original process of the titanium. And that won't tumble out. It'll be like dark and non-uniform. So well, there's all that. But the machine time on G10, we're looking at like 45 minutes. You're looking at over two hours in the titanium. So that's the cost, the two hundred dollar upcharge for the on the uh, Altai MG eighty twenty is material cost and machine time cost. We're not we're not really even upcharging the titanium. Well, uh, that's funny because as a non knife maker, I frequently will see the difference in blade steel on a knife and the upcharge, and I'm like, that is ridiculous. If you go to New Jersey Steel Baron and you look at you know uh, two different bars of steel of of you know s35 versus 3v or whatever um the the difference in in price isn't that much when you're looking at the raw steel but it has very little to do with that i guess yeah there's a lot of different things in the process and like uh on the the 10a we're using on this they find blank these blades 10a is about i'm sorry they, they what these blades? Fine, they fine blank them so it's, it's kind of like they punch them out okay it's probably more complicated than that. I've never found blank, so I don't really even know. Um, for a, a higher grade steel, more specialty steel, say 3V, that can't be fine blank. It'll destroy the, the material before it's productive to do. They have to laser them, and then the laser has to go through a secondary process and mill it. So you have more expensive steel, and then you have more expensive processes going into it. And that's where a lot of those upcharges you'll see on, on things come from different kind of heat treats and stuff uh, depending on the steel but it's yeah it's so much more than just the raw material cost right right yeah now it's totally obvious to me uh <laughs> <laughs> what this so the aus aus 10a um what do you think of this steel you know i grew up using 440c for like everything i never once ever thought to myself the 440c wasn't good enough right um you know, there's better steels out there than 10A, but it's I think it's great. It's tough and it holds the edge. And I sharpen knives a lot too. So when it does need it, I you know, I can clean it up pretty quick. But I mean, I'm pretty mean to the knives because I like to see what they can handle. And there's never been a time for me was like, oh, I don't want to carry that or anything like that. It's you know, it's it's equivalent to 440C, which is which is great. Okay, so being a guy who grew up using 440C all the time, and also being a guy who makes some of the you know uh, most premium choice uh, and hard use kind of knives out there, what do you think of the steel? Um, well, I'll say it: the steel snobbery that's out there, and and I'm totally totally a victim to it. I'll be like, oh, you know, um, you know, I'm very happy this is made out of 20 CV, even though, you know. I, I can't really tell the difference. I guess maybe I could if I sharpened it, but uh, with the way I use these knives. Yeah. You know. um, I get it and I don't get it. I don't think I could ever tell a difference between steels. 
like realistically and, and the way you use a knife every day if you sit there and you maybe cut cardboard constantly 20 cv is probably going to do the best because of the you know the edge retention on it um i don't the i just I, I think part of it is people get so passionate about buying knives and owning knives and they want to have a way to quantify it beyond just the the design and they want to know that it has this high end something to it does that actually affect anything in everyday life i don't know so like i i can see it but at the same time like i think maybe people maybe make too big a deal with it but at the same time why not want the best if, if that's the most unclear answer i can give no 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 i think that is very clear my grandmother used to say you know she's a very frugal woman she went through the depression uh but she would always say um, buy the best you can possibly afford, you know, and when you're buying a premium knife, even if you're not pushing it anywhere close to its, to its uh, borderline, you want to know that it's the best you're getting the best for the money you're spending on it. And, you know, 420 bucks, 425 bucks is not a little bit of money to right. spend on a folding knife. So it does make sense. Uh, the, you know, when you put it like that, um, you know, you at, this, at the same time, I can really understand appreciating that, but I think people forget that the stuff that's not at the top isn't that far behind. And like they want to turn their nose up at say 440C, but it's really not that far away from the rest of the stuff in, in everyday application. Right. So I can understand really appreciating the good stuff, but don't forget the other stuff is still awesome too. Yeah, it's like uh, like I mentioned before, I have tons of cold steel knives. A lot of them are OS8, some of the older ones. And, um, you know, honestly, um, yeah, I've dulled a few of them, uh, a few that I use a lot, yeah. but all the rest of them, like the big, I have a whole bunch of the big giant ones. I love yeah. the big giant cold steels. I got, I have close to 20 of them and, you know, I've almost never used them every once in a while, <laughs> except for the, I have an old Vaquero Grande with the, with the yeah. teeth on it. And I used that out back, used it a lot a lot and i think that was pre os eight days i don't even know what that steel is oh, those might have been uh vg1 or something vg1 okay yeah yeah i remember that was a steel that uh that they used a which lot which is which is if i remember correctly is pretty much the same thing as the 8a oh okay um they're, so, they're uh they're both japanese manufacturers but the, but different the, okay yeah. Use the hell out of that thing, and the the teeth have have dulled a little bit. Oh uh, yeah, those those teeth get pretty thin on some of those. Yeah, but I mean, I've never run up against the borderline of it. So yeah, you know, I'm I'm happy with with all of them. I really, for me, it's design and knowing that if I were if I were ever in a situation where I needed that super stout lock, you yeah. know, the, the thing's not going to fold on my hands. You know. Yeah. So what do you think of knife collectors? Uh, and, and, uh, and the reason I ask this, and I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to alienate yourself from, <laughs> from any of your buyers, but I used to think that collectors, people who just collect stuff were weird. And I'm like, you know, you and your crystal penguins or, you know, you and your, your wine or whatever. And until I started realizing like, wait a second, I have an inordinate amount of knives. Like <laughs> that kind of makes me a collector. And suddenly collecting doesn't seem so weird to me, but you are a maker of things that people love to collect. What, what do you think about that? Um, I like that they buy knives, first of all, which is <laughs> it's great for me. It, it helps me make a living making knives. Um, I, I have trouble understanding wanting to own something and not use it. Cause I feel like I'm that with everything I own, I want to use. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I don't know. It's just, it's not something I immediately relate to, but I can still appreciate. I, I like you really want to use all of my knives. It's just, I, in my daily life, I just don't have the, well, that's fine too. As long as, as long as you want to use them, you're oh, not, okay. you're not buying it to keep in a box and never touch. And then right. maybe flip in the future because you're a collector and you can. Right. And not to hate on people to do that, but I can't relate to that. I can totally relate to buying something with intention to use it and putting it away and forgetting about it. That, that happens. To, to, yeah. To me, it's a lot like collecting art, you know, like, um, you know, even this, this 80, 20, I've, um, 
you know, it, it's been no great chore carrying this. It's not like I'm like, oh, I got to remember to carry the 80-20. Yeah. I love it. But it's 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 a part of a collection of art to me, even though it's usable stuff. It's not something that can only be appreciated by hanging on the wall. Right. It, it, it is something that I feel like, you know, well, geez, I hope my daughters want want these because <laughs> when I kick the bucket, man, <laughs> it goes right to them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. It's. Yeah, I, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's all good. <laughs> So what is in the offing uh, for you guys? Like what, what kind of, um, what kind of knives are you thinking of in the future? Uh, I know your brother has a thing for tomahawks. Uh, he does. I, 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 I hope he doesn't listen to this and hear you say that. Cause then he'll remind me about tomahawks. I got this one <laughs> over my shoulder from his recommendation. Oh yeah. In, it's an Elmer nice. Rouge. Yeah. I think you bought uh, a couple of those there. God, I, I, I love tomahawks too. And, and I've had a, a whole rediscovery rediscovery through this one and through Wingard tomahawks. And um, so, but aside from that and fixed blades, which I know you guys also, I know he's also made um, what, what kind of things are you thinking about in the future? What kind of um, knife challenges are you going to give yourself? Oh, uh, we're seriously considering some fixed blades right now. We just went through a bunch of prototypes and I think we finally decided on something where we're probably going to do an MG line of, um, I'm not sure how soon that's going to happen, but um, Andrew came up with some really cool um, handle combinations for the, the, the blade that we figured out. Um, may, maybe a few different sizes, maybe not. We're going to see. It, mm -hmm. it could potentially be something we, we do like with the 8020. We do an in-house MG line, and then we do an overseas version of it at, you know, with comparable price points. Right. Makes sense on that kind of stuff. Um, tomahawks, I don't see how we could reasonably produce those. I, they're big, they're heavy, they take a lot of material. They take, I mean, even cutting them out, and like we'd have to have different machines in house to make that a really productive project. He, we'll probably end up doing it someday just because he loves them so much. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, I'm going to do my best to keep them on folders. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, uh, not to tell you your business, but that seems to be your bread and butter. Just, just gauging the, the, um, the reaction, not only to the 80, 20, but to man, to this 80, 20.5 and the mad rush. I mean, you guys had a lot at your booth at the start of a lot of those boxes. Anyway, these boxes at your booth, uh, I know you're familiar yeah. with the box and, <laughs> and by the, by the end they were, they were gone, daddy gone. I mean, you guys just, they, they just kept moving. Um, uh, someone left a comment on my video when I did a close up video of this a uh, couple days back um, saying they couldn't find them anywhere. Um, is there going to be another run? So let me ask you, is there another run of these coming out uh, soon? Yes. You're going to see a whole bunch um, hitting dealers in August. So the, the ones that were on dealer websites recently were all from Blade Show. Everything that's been on the market so far is from Blade Show. Um, I, the next shipment's going to be landing, I guess, next month. So, yeah, towards the end of next month. Mm -hmm. so, and by the time we inspect those and get those out, they're going to be available through dealers in August. So that's next month is July 2021, yes. you're saying? Um, you should have them by then and then you'll distribute them to your dealers. And so by August, 2021, people should get their hands on it. That's good because this show will be airing in mid July, 2021. So that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It works great. Um, man, I, I can't wait for that. Uh, any, any, um, because I'm going to get myself when, when they come out, I'm going to get myself a shark's foot, uh, since I already, already have the clip point 80, 20, I will get the shark's foot 80. I, I highly recommend the shark's foot. That's it's my personal 20.5. What do you like about that blade? I, I have always loved low points. I, um, for many reasons, first of all, I love, uh, I love Viking swords and the sacks. Yes. You know, the, they made that from the broken sword and it always had those low tips. Just think they're so cool. Yeah. Uh, as far as utility purpose goes that the low tip when you're cutting, cutting boxes. I use a knife like this a lot like that. It's, and when you're cutting, you don't need to turn way up like you went, would to get the tip with a clip point. Right. So it can be like that. And I personally find that the best way to use a knife. 
probably if um, when we come out with the Sharks for it, MG8020, that's what I'll carry too. Like that's I don't really even want to carry other things with blade shapes as far for my everyday use. Right. I I also really like the the traditional sax blade, um, the European and Viking. I mean, it's a it's beautiful and kind of rough looking, yeah. but also uh, like you said, great for utility. I have a whole bunch of them, and I tend to drop them on their very delicate tips, <laughs> and that's that's one of the things I like about this shark's foot is that that angle still looks like you can get you can puncture with it. You know, if you need to puncture through a clamshell. Um, you know, packaging or something stout, you could still get that point in, but it's not so delicate that if you drop it, which inevitably I will, it's going to snap, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it's a useful blade shape and that's, what's great about it. It's the, I guess you probably can't really see it too good, but you're, yeah, you're still going to get that, that uh, useful tip, but not that real fragile tip that you might get with another blade shape. All right. Well, John, uh, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And uh, I, I, uh, I, like I said, I've spoken with your brother, Andrew, and it's great to speak with you and kind of put together the whole picture because you guys really do. I mean, your brothers, but you fit together <laughs> really well in, in how this is happening. And, and I, I really applaud and congratulate you on your success. Uh, with Demco Knives as your own entity. I think it's it's awesome, and I think a lot of people are excited about it. Well, thank you very much. It, I really appreciate it. It's uh, It was really great talking to you, and it was an honor to be on here. And I had a lot of fun talking about knives. So. <laughs> yeah, me too. I could just talk about knives every week. Well, uh, <laughs> John, thanks a lot, and, uh, well, I'll be talking to you soon, sir. Sounds good. Take care. All right, you too. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, John Demko. I am really looking forward to my own shark's foot version of this knife. And also, if they make a shark's foot 8020, as he uh, kind of hinted at, I will, uh, well, I guess I'll have a good excuse to get another 8020. Um, well, you heard him. He said uh, late July 2021, his new, their new batch of 20.5, 80.20.5s will be uh, landing here in the States and getting distributed to dealers for sale in August of 2021. Uh, so I think uh, that's another cause for excitement we can all look forward to. Uh, you can also look forward to other great conversations with other great knife makers and personalities every Sunday here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Also check out our Wednesday supplemental shows when I get to show off new knives in my collection and talk about things in knife news. Um, Thursday Night Knives, you cannot forget about Thursday Night Knives. Join us. It's a great time, and uh, you can join us right there on screen. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And until next week, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.